We're back looking at the adventure of the Bible. And of course, you can't go on an adventure of the Bible without talking about rightly dividing. And we just got done talking about Israel. And Israel has ended up in Egypt after a famine in Canaan. And Jacob, which is Israel, went to Egypt with his 11 sons. Joseph, his other son, was in Egypt already because he had got sold into slavery. You know the story if you've read the book of Genesis. And Joseph had become the second in command to Pharaoh. But eventually, um, there was a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph, as you read in Exodus 1.8. And he makes Israel serve with rigor and hard bondage. And they're in bondage for 430 years. So they cry out for a deliverer. And that deliverer will be Moses. And you see the birth of Moses in Exodus chapter 2. You see the Lord come to him in a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. And the Lord wants him to go uh, to this Pharaoh who hates the Jews and tell him to let the Lord's people go. So Moses wants to know what to do if Israel doesn't believe that he is really a man sent from God. So that's the context of where we're at is Israel ended up going to Egypt because of the famine. Many years go by that and this new king rises up that doesn't care for Israel. And he's making them serve with rigor and hard bondage. They cry out for a deliverer. God raises up Moses. And Moses is asking the Lord, what, are the, what do I do if they don't believe? What do I do if Israel doesn't believe that I really am a man sent from God? So look at Exodus 4 and verse 1. In Exodus 4, 1, it says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. You see, that's what it's all about. Moses says, They're not going to believe me. And so the Lord's going to give him some sign gifts. So these sign gifts are all about getting someone to believe. Specifically about getting Israel to believe. It says in verse 2, and the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. So he's got this ordinary rod in his hand that's going to become something incredible that God uses. Just an ordinary, normal rod. Now you, you're just an ordinary, normal person, yet when God Almighty uses you, you become this incredible thing. And, you know, all the magicians want to copy this. Everything God has, the devil's got a counterfeit for it. Moses got a rod. What does a magician have? A wand. And Moses is even going to go against a couple magicians here pretty soon. And then in Exodus 4.3, it says, And he said, Cast it to the ground. So the Lord says, cast that rod to the ground and he cast it to the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from before it and the Lord said unto Moses put forth thine hand and take it by the tail and he put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand so Moses is like the first snake handler and I looked up uh, who who's the Who's the one that popularized snake handling? And it just happened to be a guy named George Went Hensley. And I'm like, wow, I hope this isn't my great grandfather or something. But the guy's, the guy was like 30 or 40 minutes away from me, died a long time ago of a snake bite, of course. But Moses was the first snake handler, it seems. And. This wasn't to show he's some great spiritual giant and make a movement out of it, a snake handling movement. It was a sign. 
his rod turning into a snake and then him being able to pick it up and not be hurt, it was, wasn't to show that he's this great spiritual giant. It was to show people that he is from God and to get them to believe, to get Israel to believe. Then you look at verse 5, it says just that. It says in Exodus 4, 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. It was all about getting someone to believe. Then verse 6, And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and he plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. So Moses is the first faith healer, it seems. He just healed his own leprosy. Now, what do you see the Lord Jesus Christ doing when he shows up? He's healing leprosy. So Moses, the first snake candler, the first faith healer, it would seem. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first son, that they will believe the voice of the latter son. So it's all about these signs and Moses using them to get Israel to believe. Then you go down to verse 17, it says, And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. So Moses does it. You see in Exodus 4, 28 through 31, Aaron and Israel believe the signs. Now look at Mark 16, 17. Mark 16, 17. This is in the New Testament here. And it's about signs again. In Mark 16, 17, it's the Lord speaking, and he's giving them the commission, the great commission here. And he says in Mark 16, 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. These signs. So here's these signs showing up again. Now here's the signs. He says, In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Now here's the phrase. And confirming the word with signs following. There's the phrase. These signs, the casting out devils, the speaking in new tongues, taking up serpents, just like Moses did. Moses took up a serpent. Moses healed himself. You know, all, those, all these signs. It was to confirm the word with signs following. And who was it that Moses was going to? He was going to Israel. Who was it that the Lord Jesus Christ went to? He went to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who did he tell the disciples go to? To go to Israel. And in Mark 16, 18, it talked about taking up serpents, just like Moses. Just like Paul in Acts 28, when he got uh, bit by the venomous beast, he just shook it off into the fire. And it didn't hurt him. He had the signs of an apostle. You know, you, you got him uh, here where he's telling them they can drink any deadly thing and it won't hurt them. And you don't see, that's the one you don't see them trying to counterfeit today. That'd be the hardest one, you know, getting up and drinking something deadly. That'd be the hardest one to counterfeit. But that confirming the word with signs following, that really sums it up. It isn't about showing everybody you're this big spiritual person or that you're filled with the Holy Ghost. No, it's about someone getting someone to believe the words being spoken. Okay, so we see that this is about signs. 
And then in 1 Corinthians 1, 22, remember this verse, 1 Corinthians 1, 22 says, For the Jews require a son, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So the Jews require a son. Moses did the signs to get Israel to believe. Jesus Christ came cleansing lepers, casting out devils, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, and he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came to Jews. The Jews require a sign. So, 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Jews require a sign. 1 Corinthians 14.22, tongues are for a sign. Well, who requires a sign? Israel. So tongues are, was a thing to get Israel to believe. But let's look at these times that Israel, or that, that someone spoke in tongues, and it was always a sign to unbelieving Jews. Look at Acts 2 and verse 3. And there appeared unto them a cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now look at this. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. So you got the disciples up there speaking in tongues in front of who? Jews. Then in verse 6 it says, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that they heard because that every man heard them speak in his own language. You see, this wasn't some just heavenly language that only the the disciples were speaking. No, this these were la the languages, the words that were coming out of their mouth, these tongues. This was an actual language that somebody in the world spoke. Now, the disciples didn't speak this language. That's why this is a miracle, because God was giving them the gift to speak in languages to where everybody that was there could hear it or could understand it. Every man heard them speak in his own language, not some type of heavenly language, an actual language. And... Verse 7, it says, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? They're saying, you know, all these which speak are Galileans. How are they talking in our tongue? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mock and said, These men are full of new wine. So you see, the Jews had been scattered as a judgment, scattered everywhere. And because of this, they ended up in all these different places. And because of this, they were all speaking these different languages. So the disciples got up and God had given them the gift of tongues. And they spoke in a language that everybody could understand it. It wasn't some type of uh, heavenly language that only they are, or that only God could understand. It was an actual language that somebody in the world spoke, and it was to unbelieving Jews. Just like I said, Acts two three or Acts two five, and they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews. So it was a sign to unbelieving Jews. It wasn't to show how spiritual the disciples were. It was to get unbelieving Jews to believe something, confirming the word with a sign. Then you go to Acts 10, 44 through 48. Acts 10, 44 through 48. It says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, 
And they of the circumcision, that's the Jews. The Jews are the circumcision. They of the circumcision in which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now here you go again. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So you see, they of the circumcision, which believe were astonished. They heard them speak with tongues in verse 46. So once again, tongues as a sign to unbelieving Jews. Then the last one in Acts 19, 6 through 8. Acts 19, 6 through 8. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse were hardened, and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus, and this continued by the space of two years, that all, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. But you see, they spake with tongues in verse 6. Then in verse 8 it says, And they went into the synagogue. That's where the Jews met to worship. And so you got sons and you got tongues to unbelieving Jews. So in Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19, where you got somebody speaking in tongues, it's always present, unbelieving Jews. And they're, whoever is uh, speaking, speaking in tongues, they've been given that gift by God, and it was to confirm the word, confirm that, that the Lord Jesus Christ was who he says he was, confirm that the disciples were the, really sent from God, preaching that Jesus Christ is who he says he was. But the Jews rejected Jesus. They rejected Jesus when they rejected John the Baptist. They rejected Jesus when they rejected Jesus himself and crucified him. And then you get to Acts 7 and they reject Stephen, the preaching of Stephen about the Lord Jesus. So, um, what you see in Acts is, is, it, is that it's a transition book and after Acts 7, after they reject Stephen, what you have is a shift of God no longer dealing with Israel as much, but he begins to deal with the Gentiles. He begins to deal primarily with Gentiles, and the church is made up primarily of Gentiles. You get to Acts 8, and you see the Ethiopian unit get saved. You get to Acts 9, and you got the apostle Paul getting saved, who's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. You get to Acts 10, you see Cornelius get saved, a Gentile. And it, uh, you see a, a, a real shift from God continuing to offer the kingdom to the Jews in the first seven chapters to God dealing with Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 1, the, the disciples even come to Jesus and say, Well, thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. And he doesn't give an answer because, you know, it's still up for grabs. Are the Jews going to believe and I'll give them, I'm going to go ahead and give them the kingdom now? Or are they not going to believe? And they don't believe. So you see the switch from Jew to Gentile. And it's the Jews that require a son. So over time... In the book of Acts, the sign gifts eventually phase out. And by the end of Paul's ministry, he can't heal nobody. Or he's not healing nobody, even though he had the, uh, the, the signs of an apostle. And he even says, Trophimus, have I left at Miletum sick? If he still had the gifts, why didn't he just send him a, a handkerchief? You know, he could he could send people a handkerchief and it would just heal them by that handkerchief. But he said, Trophimus, have I left at my lead him sick? In Acts nineteen twelve, 
he could send people handkerchiefs or aprons and just cause the disease to de depart from them. Isn't that amazing? But he could have just done that with Trophimus. Why didn't he send Timothy one? You know, he, he said to Timothy, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Or what about Epaphroditus over there in Philippians 2? Uh, he was sick nine to death, and the Lord heals him. It doesn't say anything about Paul laying his hands on him or sending him a, a handkerchief or something. So over time, it seems those signs, those sign gifts phase out because God's dealing with the Gentile. Israel's blind in part. They've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And But what you have with the book of Acts is it's a transition book. A lot of different things happening in there. You can't just go and... It's not rightly dividing to just go to the book of Acts and say, well, this is the doctrine for me today because you got so much different stuff going on. It's because it's a transition from Jew to Gentile. But then you get over to 1 Corinthians 14 and you see that the rules for tongues. And you, you'll see that how people are doing tongues today is completely backwards from how it's actually supposed to be. Look at 1 Corinthians 14. And let's talk about speaking in tongues. Because you see, the way people are doing it right now reveals to you that they have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to these signs and spiritual gifts. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 when he says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So he's saying the thing you really should want to do is prophesy. He doesn't say anything really good about speaking in tongues. He says in verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. And the reason he's speaking to God is, is because God's the only one that understands what he's saying because he's speaking in an unknown tongue. And when un when you say unknown tongue, it doesn't mean like some some heavenly language that nobody on earth speaks. It's a language that people actually speak, just like in Acts 2 it says, and every man heard them speak in their own language. The reason it's unknown is because in that particular room, God's the only one that knows what you're saying. The other people in there don't speak that same language. So you're not speaking to them. You're just speaking to God. For no man understand. For no man understandeth them. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Like when I was at that meeting with that, at that, uh, at that Pentecostal church, that guy, he was edifying me. He was giving me something from the Bible through the sermon. But then at the end, he started speaking in tongues. That edification, that exhortation, and that comfort left. I had no idea what he was, what was being said. And I just felt like he was doing it so he could say that he did, to keep being a member of the club, you know. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. You know, that probably helped him, I guess, for him to go, I can't, I can't even mock what he did. For him to do that, he pro it probably edified him, probably made him feel better about himself. But it didn't do anything for me. I didn't know what he was saying. And I'm not impressed with that junk. Maybe those other people there, they got something out of it because they're impressed with it doesn't impress me at all i want to be impressed with the book i'm not impressed by your talent and how charismatic you are you're not impressing me i get impressed with the bible and paul says in verse five i would that ye all spake with tongues but rather that ye prophesied so if paul puts the emphasis on prophesying um then why the all the emphasis on tongues, you see. It says, For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So, 
It's about, you know, you edifying the church, not yourself. He says, now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall it profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. See, it's not going to profit them. They don't even know what you're saying. You want to come with uh, something that's going to help them. And he says in verse 7, And even things without life given sound with their pipe or harp, except they give distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an, an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? If what you're saying is uncertain, how are they going to prepare themselves for the spiritual battle, you see? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the, by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak it, speak into the air. So you want to get up, when you get up in front of people, you want to utter words that are easy to be understood. Not some jibber-jabber. That's crazy. But look down at verse 22, and let's... I would like to go over the whole chapter, but I just want to show you. In 1 Corinthians 14, 22, it says, Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. You see that? Not to them that believe. But you got these people in churches getting up speaking in tongues, and everybody there is a believer. But it's supposed to be a sign to those that don't believe, like in Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19. It was a sign to unbelieving Jews. Tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. It's to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth for them that not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. You get up and prophesy, giving them something out of this Bible, that's for believers. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues... You got everybody in there doing all these different languages nobody even knows. And there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. Will they not say that you are mad? And that's the truth. They're going to think you're crazy. They're coming in there and they see you saying all this junk. They don't even know what you're saying. They're going to be, their kids are going to be laughing at you. And they're going to feel uncomfortable. But then it says, but if I'll prophesy... And there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned. He is convinced of all. He is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth because he understood exactly the message, you see. Now here's the rules that they don't follow and it exposes them as frauds. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath the psalm, hath the doctrine, hath the tongue, hath the revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. Edifying others, not yourself. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most... At the most by three, and that by course, meaning one at a time, and let one interpret. So it can only be two or three people at a time, but that one at a time, and let one interpret. You don't see that. It's a whole bunch of people going at it, a bunch of them, and it ain't one at a time. But if there be no interpreter... Let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. You see, if he's up there speaking in an unknown tongue, a language that nobody in the church speaks, he's not going to edify them unless somebody gets up and also speaks that language and they can interpret what he's saying. You see, then they can be edified because they then understand this truth that he has. You see, it's to edify others. Everything you do, you should edify others with it. And if, if he's not going to have an interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. 
It says in verse 29, let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. It says, for ye all, for ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. So you just want one guy preaching at once. You don't want a guy over here preaching while this guy's preaching, while this guy's preaching, and while this guy's preaching. You're wanting things to where people can hear what's being said and it's going to edify them and they can leave with something that they didn't have when they got there. Not a quick emotional experience that's going to help them temporarily, but something that's said that's gonna, that they can put in their heart and take with them. It says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In verse 32. You see, you're in control of your spirit. This stuff where you just are uncontrollably speaking in tongues, uncontrollably rolling on the floor. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now here's another rule they break. Let your women keep silence in the churches. And this is in the context of prophesying and speaking in tongues. So you shouldn't have women preaching in the church and they shouldn't be speaking in tongues. But what do you see when you go to these tongue-speaking churches is a good portion of them are women. And it ain't just two or three and one at a time, an interpreter. It's a whole bunch of women speaking in tongues all at the same time. And it's not a, 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 a known language. It's some jibber-jabber that they're making up as they go. <sighs> For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for women to speak in the church when it comes to prophesying and tongues is the context. The C, it says, Let all things be done decently in order. In verse 40, and that's out of order, what people's doing. They're not rightly dividing. It's a big mess. And when you try to put these signs on you in the church that are for Israel, you're not rightly dividing at all. You're messing everything up. And you're, you see all these, you doing all these signs usually, when people are pretending to have these signs, they're putting all the focus on themselves Look at me, I speak in tongues. Look at me, I can heal people. Look at me, I can cast out devils. Look at me, I can pick up this serpent. Claiming to have the signs of an apostle when there's no apostles today. You're putting the, the it puts the focus on them. And there's usually a, a lot of money behind it. But you need to put the focus on the scripture, not you. And the more charismatic you are, and the more you try to be flashy with it, the more you're just really just putting the focus on yourself. See, there's nothing good about me. I'm a boring person. My voice is probably very plain and boring to you. But I'm wanting the focus to be on the scriptures. That's what I want you to be impressed with. Not me, because I'm nothing. Nothing to be impressed with about me. The great thing is the Word of God. The great thing is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope this has helped you. Rightly dividing. As you can see, Moses starts his ministry with signs to Israel. So therefore the signs, the sign gifts are for Israel. And since this is the church age, it's not the church that requires a sign, not Gentiles. It's the Jews that require a sign. 